What is going on, everyone? This is Eric coming at you live from just outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And today we're going to continue our player bio series as we look at one of the most underrated players in MLB history, Satchel Page. Now, a lot of people who are going to be over the age of 60 will remember Satchel Page. Over the age of 70, definitely will remember Satchel Page. But unfortunately, he is one of the names that has really forgotten to history, especially for people who are around my age, you know, here in our younger 20s. So Satchel Page played professional baseball for the majority of his life, but unfortunately, he was not at the major league level. Why? Racism. So without further ado, we will jump right into the Satchel Page player bio. So... Page himself was born as Leroy Page on July 7th, 1906 in Mobile, Alabama. Now, 1906 is a bit questionable. There's no 100% guarantee that it was 1906. The range does vary for a few years, but we're sticking with 1906. It is the most accepted answer as to when he was born. So there is a bit of mystery surrounding his nickname of Satchel. But Page himself did give an explanation at some point in his life. He gave multiple different ones, but this is the one that he normally would give. So he said that as a child, he used to work at the train station. And what he would do is he would carry bags for people at a dime a piece. So you would give Satchel Page a dime, and he would carry the bag for you from wherever when you got off the train to wherever you were going. And uh, at one point, he decided to use a pole and a rope so he can carry up to four bags at a time. Now, another child allegedly told Page that he, quote, looked like a satchel tree, end quote, end quote. And then they started calling him Satchel. And obviously, the nickname stuck. So Page did have a little bit of a, ch a troubled childhood. At the age of 12, he was sent to a reform school as punishment for engaging in a rock-throwing battle with other children. Now, he was also believed to be a shoplifter. And at this point, his father had left the family. So people were kind of like, oh, you know, his mother can't control him. We'll just send him to the reform school so, you know, he doesn't keep messing around with the neighborhood. And for Paige, honestly, the reform, the reform school was a blessing in disguise. He matured and he learned how to pitch while there. Now, when he was asked about his experience at the reform school, he stated, quote, I traded five years of freedom to learn how to pitch. At least I started my real learning on the mount. They were not wasted years at all. It made a real man out of me, end quote. So uh, it's worth noting definitely that Satchel Page is at where he was African-American, and that does end up playing a major role in his life. So Page began to play for some semi-pro teams when he turned 18. In 1926, he was signed by the Chattanooga White Sox of the Negro Southern League, which was a minor league a team affiliated with the Negro League. And... He, he played there for a little over a year before he was sold to the Birmingham Black Barons of the Negro National League. At this point, Page was known as a flamethrower, but he was erratic and wild. So, not horrible, but he, he had the speed. He just didn't have the control. So, over the next two seasons, Page established himself as a star. Now, Negro League records are unfortunately very spotty, but... It's alleged that he recorded either 167 or 176 strikeouts over 160.1 innings pitched. So this is possibly the single season Negro League record for strikeouts. Page went on to Cuba, but after that 1929 season it ended, but he really, really hated it big time. He did not speak the language of Spanish, which obviously caused a few problems. Now there's a few stories and uh, one of the ones that stuck out to me was when he was asked by the mayor of a town if he had intentionally lost a game. So since he didn't understand Spanish, he would always just kind of smile and nod, expecting people to be, you know, praising him like, oh, you were such a good player last game. You did great. He would just smile and nod. And, you know, that's all you could do. What else could he do? He didn't know how to say, you know, he didn't want to be rude and say no to everybody. So since he was asked if he had intentionally lost the game, he just nodded and smiled like he always did. Now, obviously, this did not end well for Page, and he had to flee the area. Another scene happened when he allegedly proposed to a woman, and he's like, no, 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 so he fled the area. That story is a little spotty, but 
The one with the Cuban mayor is just one that really stuck out to me. So Page did return to the Negro League after the season had ended, and he did well in 1930 and 1931, but he bounced around between teams. Now, this is in part because the Great Depression was really bad for the Negro Leagues. So obviously, you know the Great Depression affected Major League Baseball. You can imagine how much it affected the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues were not properly funded, especially compared to, you know, the Major Leagues themselves. So, yeah, um, very few teams could even afford to pay what Page was worth. And he was he was worth a good chunk of money. In June of 1931, he joined the Crawford Colored Giants. Now, this team would add multiple stars, including Hall of Famers Cool Papa Bell and Josh Gibson. In 1933, Page would jump to a North Dakota Independent League team for a month. Now, this was noticeable, notable because this team itself was actually integrated, so he was playing alongside white players for the first time, professionally at least. 1934 was Page's best season as a pro. In September of that year, Page went up against Slim Jones and was considered by many to be the greatest game in Negro history. The two of them would do to a 1-1 tie, which was called due to dar darkness. Now, Page also dueled Hall of Famer Dizzy Dean in another pitcher's duel, with Page's team winning that game 1-0. One notable attendee at this game was Bill Veck. Veck becomes important in the Page story later on. So Page would return to North Dakota in 1935, which led to him temporarily being banned from returning to the Crawford Colored Giants and the Negro National League. He had, had, he had a falling out with the ownership of that team and of the league because he kept jumping ship. He would cost the team money because people paid tickets. You know, people would buy tickets just to see Satchel Page pitch. So in February of 1936, Page and his team would face off against Joe DiMaggio. Now, this isn't the New York Yankees. This is Joe DiMaggio's minor league team. Now, DiMaggio's team was much, much better than Page's team, but Page's team kept it very close because Page himself was so good. And the final score of this game was 2-1 to one through 10 innings. DiMaggio later referred to Page as, quote, the best I've ever faced and the fastest, end quote. In 1937, Page went on to play in the Dominican Republic on a team that was owned by the dictator of the country. So Page was paid $30,000 to recruit as many stars as he could to join him on the team. And he would recruit a team that would win the championship. Now, there was a lot of problems with this. Obviously, if you're... There were apparently armed guards around him at all times. And even during the championship, there were armed guards all around him with loaded guns and everything. And, uh, of course, the government and everyone said, oh, no, they're, they're for your protection. But Page and all the guys he recruited felt that they were there. So, you know, Page and the guys he recruited wouldn't run. And if they lost games, they felt that they might have, you know, they might get, they might be on the business end of those guns. So... The following year saw him go to the Mexican League, and unfortunately, he would suffer a career-threatening arm injury. So he was in intense pain, and when he returned to the United States, it, he was found, you know, he found that he was banned from the Negro League for good. He ended up joining a barnstorming team that also served as a minor league club. So barnstorming teams were teams that just basically, they took a bunch of players, and they would travel around. They would go wherever they wanted to. Think Harlem Globetrotters, but for baseball. And of course, yeah, Harlem Globetrotters, but for baseball is the best way to put it. So during this time, his injury healed. Now, the injury was really bad, and many speculate that it was a partially torn rotator cuff. Now, even today in 2021, that's not a good injury for a pitcher to have. But he also tried to play through it, which you can only imagine what would happen. So this did slightly affect him as a player. He lost some of the oomph that he had as a flamethrower, but he was still a very good crafty player, so he could get around it. So he would play winter ball in Puerto Rico in the 1939-1940 season, where he really left an impact. Now, he set multiple single-season records there, which were never broken as the league no longer exists, including strikeouts and wins over 205 innings. Now, he threw 208 strikeouts in 205 innings. innings. That's impressive. He went 19-3 and three with a 1.93 ERA that year. That's some winter. In 1940, Page was allowed to join the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro American League. So he was allowed to return to the Negro Leagues, 
after the Kansas City Monarchs reached an agreement with the owners of the New York Eagles who owned his rights. And basically what had happened is they they agreed, look, we'll we'll let you have Satchel Page if you look to forego us having a couple players that we illegally recruited from you. And, you know, it, that's what it was. Now, Page is known for his time with the Kansas City Monarchs. So he settled in once more, and he proved himself to be a superstar once more. Thousands of fans would just go to the games to see him. They didn't care about the rest of the team. They didn't care about the rest of the players. They just wanted to see Satchel Page pitch. He was well-known across the community. Now, this ended up leading to Page being loaned to other teams for cash. So basically, people, teams like if, if you owned a team in, let's just say, uh, you know, Austin, Texas, you were a Negro League team, you would offer Kansas City, let's just say, $5,000 and 20% of the gate to have Satchel Page. And then Satchel Page would also get, let's just say, 10% of what you brought in or 20% of what you brought in. And teams, teams love to do it. Satchel Page was so good, everyone wanted to see him play. So he was earning roughly $40,000, all things considered, in the early 1940s. And that was just a, you know, for comparison, that was just a hair under what Joe DiMaggio was making for the New York Yankees. Page was the first ever black player to pitch at Wrigley Field when the Monarchs would play Dizzy Dean's All-Stars, who consisted of mostly young, recently drafted Caucasian players. The Monarchs would actually win this game, surprisingly. But at the same time, it's a lot of veterans that have been together for years. So the 1942 Negro World Series was eventful for Page. He actually pitched in all five games of this World Series. Now, he was late to game five as he appeared in the fourth inning. Now, this is interesting. He was late to the game because he was arrested for speeding. So Page attempted to start a player strike in 1944, but it did not end well for him. He had demanded that the owners donated the money collected from the Negro League All-Star game uh, to the War Relief Fund. And he threatened a strike, and he tried to get everyone else to threaten a strike if they did not donate it. However, the owners revealed that Page had earned $800 from playing in the 1943 All-Star game, while all other players only got $50. So basically, it's like, you're a hypocrite. You got you know 16 times what everyone else is getting, so we don't want to hear you talking. So Page ends up getting removed from the All-Star Game roster, but all the other players that were involved in the All-Star Game just get their bonuses increased for making it. So there's that. So Page did have a slightly positive impact. Page and the Monarchs would make it to the 1946 Negro World Series, but Page was nowhere near effective in pre as previous seasons. He was mostly used in relief. Now keep in mind, he's also 40 years old at this point. So before the pivotal Game 7, Page just disappeared. The Monarchs would lose this game and thus the series. Now, it is believed that Page did not show up to Game 7 because he had a meeting with Bob Feller. Now, the two of them would end up embarking on a barnstorming tour in the winter of 1946 to 1947. They each assembled all-star teams, one full of MLB stars and the other full of Negro League stars. Now, this didn't end well for Page, though, as he ended up suing Feller for not being paid properly. Page appeared done as no one really wanted to deal with him. He was struggling and he had the off the field concerns. But Bill Veck, who was at the greatest Negro game ever played, came in and helped. So on July 7th, 1948, which was Page's 42nd birthday, he signed a contract to play for the Cleveland Indians of Major League Baseball. He would debut two days later, which makes him the oldest man to ever debut in the majors at 42 years and two days. He was also the first black pitcher in MLB history. Many MLB batters were confused by Page's pitches. A well-known Cubs announcer stated that Page, quote, threw a lot of pitches that were not quite legal and not quite illegal, end quote. So Page is known for his famous hesitation pitch. Now, it's really difficult to explain how the hesitation pitch works. I would definitely recommend watching a video of it on any, any platform. YouTube's probably going to be the best. It's a very interesting pitch, and you can see why it confused a heck of a lot of hitters. So this pitch would end up getting outlawed by Major League Baseball because of how silly Page made everybody look when he threw it. So Page had a great season for Cleveland, going 6-1 and one with a 2.48 ERA while appearing in 21 games. Cleveland would go on to win the World Series that year, and Page would appear in one game in said World Series, pitching two-thirds of an inning in relief. 
He struggled a bit the following year in 1949. And after Vec would sell the team, Page was released. You know, Page was just kind of like Vec's experiment, so to speak. And new ownership didn't want anything to do with him. So Page ends up rejoining Bill Vec in 1951 after Vec would purchase the St. Louis Browns. And he continued to play well and was the first player, black player to ever make an AL All-Star team in 1952. So he would slump in 1953 and was released after Bill Vec sold the team. So he would return to barnstorming for two years before joining Bill Vec once more, playing three years on the Phillies AAA affiliate from 1956 to 1958. He was very good, but he was 49, 50, and 51 years old. So he was going up against young kids. Of course, you're going to look decent. You you know what you're doing. You've been in the majors. You're you know, one of the best players to ever play the sport. You're going to make anyone look silly, especially young kids. So for the next half decade after that, Page rarely played. He focused on barnstorming. On September 25th, 1965, Page would make another bold play when he actually played a single game for the Kansas City Athletics. He pitched three innings, allowing no runs on a single hit. He was 59 years old at this point. That's insane. A 59-year-old player played a Major League Baseball game. So that ends his baseball career. But... After baseball, Page lived an interesting life. He would take the position of deputy sheriff, but he didn't bother showing up to work. Basically, he took the position of deputy sheriff because he wanted to run for politics. He wanted to get into politics. And he was told, if you take this position, you at least have a background in public office. You don't need to go to work. You can just stay at home, do what you want to do. So he would, he would run one time for state assembly, but he would lose. He did appear in one exhibition game in Major League Baseball in 1969, however, and this was just a spring training game. Basically, what had happened is the Atlanta Braves owner had basically offered Page a two-year dummy deal to be like a pitching coach and a player, and this was so he can get, you know, money, so he could have played long enough in the majors to qualify for getting money in retirement. So, yeah. Uh, Page was the first African-American player to be elected in the Hall of Fame in 1971 along for the Negro Leagues. And uh, basically what had happened is they had announced that they were going to make the, you know, Negro Leagues, some Negro League stars Hall of Famers. And everyone said, we want Satchel Page to be the first Hall of Famer, you know, the first Negro League Hall of Famer, the first African-American Hall of Famer, however you want to say it. And uh, everybody basically was like, yeah, you know what, that's fine. But he he had just pitched in a couple years prior, so they kind of held off the inauguration for all of them into the Hall of Fame until Page was eligible, and they made sure he was the first one announced because everyone didn't feel right having it not be Satchel Page. So he was a minor league pitching coach from 1973 until the late 70s, but he was mostly just there in name. He didn't do much of anything. He would show up a couple games help guys, and then he would just disappear for a week. Nobody really knew where he went. He just went home. Now, on June 8th, 1982, Page would pass away from a heart attack at his home. He was 75 years old. Interesting career, sad end to his long life, but little summary of him. So Page was known for his fastball which and his hesitation pitch, as well as a fast curveball. Now, this was used for the first time after Dizzy Dean had publicly stated that Page couldn't throw a curveball early on in his career. Now, after that serious arm injury in 1939, he slowed down the speed of his curveball and added a knuckleball, a sinker, and a changeup. He also threw side-armed and some marine style when he needed to. Now, this he basically would use whatever style best suited his needs. There was a lot of movement when he pitched, and it really confused people, specifically that hesitation pitch. Now, he was known for his amazing control. So here are the accolades for him. He was a two-time MLB All-Star. He was a five-time Negro League All-Star, keeping in mind that they didn't have the Negro League All-Star game until 1933, and he also spent a lot of time just not in the Negro Leagues. He would be barnstorming or he would be elsewhere. He was a one-time World Series champion, a one-time Negro League World Series champion, and he's a member of the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame, as well as a member of the MLB Hall of Fame 1971 class. So that is the player bio of Satchel Page. 
Satchel Paige is one of the most interesting players in MLB history, even in sports history. He's just been overlooked by history, unfortunately, in part because he played in the Negro Leagues. So a lot of his records are just kind of afterthoughts, which really stinks. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. That was the Satchel Page one. Have a good rest of your day.